All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got another episode of the Slay at Home Speaker Series going on tonight. And every Thursday at 6 p.m., we're coming to you live from somewhere deep in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, USA. Tonight's episode and every episode is presented by Weston. Uh, we've got a lot of people tuning in tonight, so thank you for joining us. I'm seeing people from all over, man, a lot of Colorado, which we obviously love to see. A lot of people tuning in from uh, the Great White North up in Canada. I'm seeing a lot of our buddies out in BC showing up, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, people all over, I'm seeing Wyoming, I saw New Hampshire, saw Chicago recently, so man, a uh, lot of lot of people tuning in tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, you know, we're putting these on every Thursday, most of the season. We did take a little break last week for Thanksgiving, so hopefully everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, keep letting us know where you're tuning in from. We're going to let kind of more and more people just tune in, and we'll get started here shortly. But again, thanks so much for being here. We really do appreciate it. We love putting these things on for you guys. So we'll see you every Thursday here moving forward, you know, and Thursdays at 6 p.m. Give us a like, give us a share at westonbackcountry.com or Weston on Facebook, and you can kind of stay up to date with all the different great speakers, all the different great topics we have going on this season, and we've got a whole lot more coming up. So we're only on, I think, episode four here, and we're trying to push it out to 16 episodes. So we've got a lot of really cool topics coming down the pipe. So without any further ado, we have, tonight we'll be discussing Get Outside, how to plan a backcountry trip. So tonight's episode is also sponsored by Colorado Adventure Guides. We have some amazing guides on staff there at Colorado Adventure Guides. And we also have uh, joining us from the CAIC, a great forecaster who's going to really walk you through a lot of great things there on the CAIC website and even avalanche.org. So a um, lot of great stuff to discuss tonight. If you have questions for us or for any of the uh, speakers this evening, put it in the Q&A. Um, this, this chat feature, which I can see we're all using, is more for just back and forth and, and chit-chatting a little bit. And uh, the chat is really where you want to focus your, your real questions, your specific questions for any of the experts we have tonight. So definitely use that Q&A. At the end of the presentation, we'll go through all of the questions that you guys have posted in the Q&A section and make sure that they're all answered. So again, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, we will be recording this presentation and it will be available next week is usually when we drop them there on the, the Weston Facebook page and also on our website, westonbackcountry.com. So we have um, a, a good agenda tonight. We're gonna you know, go over everything you should discuss before you even get to planning a trip. So a pre-trip checklist, things that you should really be looking at before you use all the skills you're gonna learn tonight. We'll discuss group dynamics and how you know, who you're going out with really dictates a, a lot of the choices you make for planning a trip. We'll discuss the forecast, how to check it, where to find it, um, and we'll do a, a pretty in-depth demo tonight for you guys and how to check your local avalanche forecast and then use what you learn in that forecast to plan a trip. We'll go over various trip planning resources, everything from, you know, online resources to hard copies and things that you know, we use every day to, to go out and plan a trip. So a lot of good details there. Then we'll even actually plan a trip. We'll take you, you know, from, from A to B, what, what you need to learn on, on how to plan a trip. So, and we'll, we'll kind of walk you through all those steps. Justin and Pat from Colorado Adventure Guides will be kind of doing a virtual trip planning workshop. Um, we'll also discuss things to really consider while you're out on trail. Um, and then even a debrief, so an after trip, what you should be going over. Um, so really, you know, we're going to walk you through everything you need to know um, and at least touch on certain things so you can really expand your, your knowledge of these things and practice them yourselves and eventually get to where you can plan your own trips. Um, again, we'll end with a, a Q&A. So let us know any questions you guys have. Thanks for tuning in tonight. 
Um, I am Ben. I am our brand experience manager. I wear many hats. I, I kind of oversee all of our educational programming, our guided programming, our partnerships, anything avalanche education related, I try to you know get my hands into. I also have the privilege of working on our design team here at Weston. So I get to help design a lot of the split boards and, and snowboards that you guys see and even get to play with some skis here and there. So I've also been a backcountry guide for over a decade. So I really love spending my time in the backcountry and I love ju just really sharing my knowledge of, of the mountains with other people. So we've also got Creston from the CAIC here tonight. Creston, thanks so much for being here, buddy. We're stoked to have you. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, to echo what you said, it's uh, it's really cool to see all the different people tuning in tonight. So um, yeah, happy to uh, be a part of this. Um, so a little background on me. I'm the, uh, the local backcountry forecaster for uh, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Uh, I'm based out of the Vail area and I forecast for the um, Vail Summit County and Steamboat Flattop Zones. Um, I was a longtime ski patroller in Colorado and Montana. Um, done a bunch of mechanized guiding, uh, backcountry guiding, uh, taught a bunch of avalanche education, was a heli guide in Alaska. Uh, so I've kind of run the gamut um, of professional things in snow and avalanche world before landing my job at the Avalanche Center. Um, but very stoked to be here tonight. Killer, buddy. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it and are looking forward to you sharing some knowledge with us this evening. We've also got Justin, one of our team riders and um, just one of the best guides around from Colorado Adventure Guides and Colorado Snowboard Guides. Justin, man, thanks so much for being here, buddy. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. I'm excited to be here. Uh, super stoked, as always, on what you guys are doing. Uh, so just a little bit of background on myself. I work with Colorado Adventure Guides. We're based out of sunny Summit County, Colorado here, doing year-round adventures. Um, and yeah, super stoked to be here. I'm an Airy Avalanche course leader. I've uh, been ski guiding. I've been in the outdoor industry of guiding and outdoor education for about 15 years or so everywhere from Colorado to Alaska to uh, Kyrgyzstan and so forth so super stoked to be here and and uh, share some knowledge and learn from maybe some of the other panelists on here as well so super stoked to be here yeah buddy thanks so much and last up we've got Pat Gephardt another you know fantastic Weston guide team member and guide for Colorado Adventure Guides. Pat, buddy, thanks so much for being here, man. Hey, thanks for having me. And yeah, like Ben said, I'm an athlete for Weston uh, Guide with Justin over at Colorado Adventure Guides. Um, I'm also a freelance software engineer, so it takes up a lot of my time. Um, but it's like to uh, work on some trip planning with everyone because it's something that I underutilized quite a bit early in my career. And it's a very important and very powerful. Uh, it gets you educated and knowledgeable on when you're in the backcountry. So yeah, excited to share what I know. Well, awesome. Yeah, and again, you guys, if you do have questions, feel free to, to ask, you know, we'll try to get them all answered tonight. But, you know, without any further ado, let's kind of get into it here. I'm, I'm really gonna pass the ball here to Justin. Um, these guys are all experts in their field. So, so I'm just gonna let them kind of clue you guys in on starting with, you know, the things you should really be looking at before you even get to planning a trip. So Justin, feel free to take it away, brother. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Yeah, guys, so realistically, before you even start planning a backcountry trip, just wanna make sure you're ready to do so. You've uh, kind of been versed in the techniques and so forth. Uh, so some of the, the main questions off the bat, first and foremost, is do you have the right gear? Uh, I know we had a great webinar here at the Slay at Home series that talked about gear. Hopefully you guys all tune into that. Um, kind of letting you all know what you should be bringing out there in the backcountry with you. But do you have a beacon shovel probe? Do you have a repair kit? Does your group have a repair kit? Do you have a first aid kit? Do you know how to use all that? Do you have the skills in order to do so? If you if you don't, maybe find a mentor, take you, show you under their wings, and kind of show you the ropes, uh, or maybe hire a guide, get that more more intimate atmosphere where you're gonna get out there and show you this whole process on a a, a small guest to guide ratio um, and avalanche education is crucial as well do you have any formal avalanche education do you have mentors that have gone out and kind of shown you the ropes so again before we even start planning our backcountry trip we just want to make sure that we're ready um, and if you're not ready there's outlets to do so find a mentor sign up for Matt for some avalanche education utilize some of the free resources out there like this tonight um, or again maybe hire a guide 
So once you felt, realize that you are ready to eventually plan your backcountry tour, where do I start? So it really starts with assembling your group, assembling your team. Um, that really is going to dictate, along with the weather and the avalanche forecast, where you're going to go for the day. Okay, so certain people I might go ski gnarly kular with. Certain people I might just go ski the fluffy bunny trees. Okay, so who you go with, assembling your group is super important, and that's really usually where you're going to start. Even if you have a line in mind, maybe I want to go ski that gnarly kular there's certain people you're going to bring together to make that happen and certain people you're not. So really planning your backcountry tour, this is where it all starts. Get your group together. So some of the few key things we want to think about, how many people, how many people should I reach out to to, to get out on this tour? And so realistically, a great number or a few numbers to kind of keep in mind is about three to five in your touring group. Um, much more, if you have more than five, it's just too many people. It's too many chiefs in the Indian tribe. It's hard to make decisions. So people think safety in numbers, but this is, you know, this is not the case. And so three to five is kind of your ideal uh, touring party size. Personally, I like three. That's kind of my magic number. Um, if something were to happen, one person can stay with somebody, one person go out for help. Um, but that again, three to five is kind of your ideal number for group size. Um, so that kind of hits your group number. The next thing we want to talk about with assembling a group is risk tolerance. Now, everybody has different risk tolerances out there. But we want to make sure, first and foremost, people can get out that have different risk tolerances. What you need to do is make sure that you align those risk tolerances. And you're going to align those risk tolerances to the least risk tolerance of the group, right? You don't want to be the person who is bringing somebody into terrain they don't feel comfortable going into. That's not the way we want to plan our tour. So again, you can go out with people who have different risk tolerances, but you need at this stage in the game of your tour plan, make sure that everybody understands the risk that everybody is willing to take for the day and align to that lowest person. So that's super important. So once we have our group number, we've all aligned our risk tolerances for the day. Then we want to talk about our goals for the day, making sure we're aligning our goals. What is the goal for the day? Do we want to just get out and enjoy beautiful sunshine? And ski some great snow? Are we going after a big objective? Are we trying to ski the Grand Teton, right? So the goals would be your next step. What are we trying to achieve for the day? After you guys have aligned your goals, some other things that are key to talk about, do we have any medical concerns or any personal stuff that might inhibit today's tour? Uh, medical stuff is crucial. Any fast acting medications? Is anybody uh, using an inhaler? Um, Bad breakup, you know, did your cat die last night? Did you work a long double shift? All of this can stray your mental thought processes that can inhibit potentially your tour for the day. So it's really important to discuss all that amongst your group. And once you've discussed all these, you've got your number, you uh, aligned your risk tolerances, you've aligned your goals for the day, you discuss medical personal info, maybe you get emergency contacts for people. Um, then you want to just uh, make sure that everybody gets this verbal contract in play. And what I mean by verbal, verbal contract is that we all agree as a team to travel together, to decide together, and ride together. So it's not one person leading the group. It's not two people leading the group. It's everybody collectively making these decisions as a team. And that is super important. You need to make sure that everybody you're out there with respects a veto. So if somebody doesn't feel comfortable about something, you need to be okay with that and back up and maybe go with option B, option C, option D, which we'll talk about later in this presentation. So again, assembling the group is super crucial. This is really where you want to start. By assembling your group, the next thing you're going to do really is starting to look at the forecast. Um, so the forecast, there's different outlets we can use. Um, the two things we're going to look at for as far as anticipating the forecast is going to be weather and your avalanche hazard so there's different resources we can use, and we're going to be showing you some of those here shortly. Um, so for weather, some of those resources, NOAA, Open Snow, or even CAIC, which Crescent's going to demo here shortly, will give you some idea of the weather forecast. So when we're thinking about weather, we want to look at the forecast, we want to look at trends, and then think, how can that weather affect the travel or the hazard for the day? All righty. So is it completely nuking out there in blizzard-like conditions? that's gonna affect travel for the day and probably also affect the hazard for the day. And so we really want to clue into looking at the weather forecast and then thinking to ourselves and discussing amongst our groups, how can that affect my travel and how can that potentially affect the hazard for the day, all right? So 
uh, sky cover? Is it sunny? Is it overcast? Wind? Is it windy? Where is it coming from? Uh, precipitation? Is it snowing? How hard is it snowing? So all key things to clue into for weather. And then the trend throughout the day. Is it going to be sunny in the morning and then a big storm comes in in the afternoon? Maybe we should try and be back at the cars by a certain time before that storm comes in. So understanding trends as well with the weather is also important. So now once we have an understanding with the weather forecast and how, again, that can affect our travel and hazard for the day, then we'll start looking at the avalanche forecast. And similarly, how can that affect my travel for the day? So when we're looking at the forecast, again, Crescent's going to demo CAIC here shortly. Some of the key things we're going to look for in that forecast, what's the danger rating? That's, that is just a start point. I'm going to put that out there. I'm sure Crescent's going to hit on here <laughs> soon. That is not the end-all decision-making tool for the day. The avalanche hazard is a great starting point. Don't just look at a color and decide your tour off of that. Okay, look at the color. And then for me, more importantly, what is the avalanche problem that I'm likely to encounter for the day? Is it a persistent slab? That sure is going to change my observations and my decisions potentially for the day. Okay, so what is the avalanche problem I'm likely to encounter? Where is it in the terrain? Where am I likely to encounter? What aspect, what elevation? What is the likelihood of me triggering this slide? And what is the destructive potential? All right. So for me personally, that right there is way more important than the danger rating. What the avalanche problem is, what the flavor of that beast is, where it is likely for me to encounter, the likelihood of me triggering it, and the size potential. All right. And then also some other stuff you'll see on here, again, which Crescent's going to demo here shortly, is a summary or a detailed uh, report of those conditions. A lot of times they do a really good job of telling you where you shouldn't go and some areas are you know, potentially better for you to go in terrain. Uh, some other cool things on there is recent uh, avalanche activity. Recent avalanche, recent avalanche activity is our most direct indicator of instability in the snowpack. So if you're seeing a trend, avalanche is happening on a similar aspect and elevation, that's to clue into you. That, that is potentially a problematic aspect and elevation that I might want to avoid. All right. So looking at recent avalanche activity and then recent field or weather observation. People are submitting observations to CAIC and other forecasting sites out there and letting you know what they see out there. Teamwork makes a dream work. The more we collectively share what we see, the more better of our understanding we're gonna have, the more intimate we're gonna have with our terrain and our snowpack. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of checking the, uh, the weather and the uh, forecast. Some of the avalanche forecasting resources you'll find here in the States, avalanche.org is a great one. If you don't know who your lo local avalanche forecasting center is, just type in avalanche.org. It's going to show you lower 48 here, and it's going to tell you where the forecasting centers are. It's not going to be anything in the middle of the country. There's no snow or mountains in Kansas. Most of it will be on the western side of the country, a little bit on the east coast. Uh, but avalanche.org is a great spot to start if you're in lower 48, or I saw a lot of folks tuning in from Canada. You're going to start at avalanche.ca, so Avalanche Canada. Um, and so there's, those are some great forecasting resources. Check out your local forecasting center. Again, that's here in Colorado, CAIC, Utah Avalanche Center, um, Matt Washington Avalanche Center. So check your local avalanche forecasting center. They're gonna have a, a, a better idea uh, on a more localized scale of what the avalanche forecast is looking like. Um, cool, so I'm gonna kick it over here to Creston. He's gonna go ahead and go over a nice uh, demo of the avalanche forecast. Awesome, thanks, Justin, appreciate it. Um... Yeah, everyone, I'm just going to uh, get fired up here. You guys all see that? Good to go. Um, should have avalanche or uh, avalanche.org lit up here on the screen. And so um, avalanche.org is a, uh, it's a website and um, a bunch of other things hosted by, um, it's a, a partnership between the American Avalanche Association and the uh, Forest Service National Avalanche School. So, um, you know, if you're unfamiliar with uh, the forecasting center in the region that you live in, uh, you can go to this site, uh, hover over any of the uh, highlighted zones, and it'll take you um, to a direct link to that um, to that forest, or uh, I'm sorry, to that avalanche center's uh, website and webpage. Um, same for Canada, uh, just avalanche.ca. You'll get a, a similar readout with um, uh, all their different zones and uh, forecast areas lit up. Uh, but for us, uh, we're concerned, or I work for uh, the Avalanche Center down here in Colorado, and that's what I'm going to dig into here tonight. 
Um, another quick point too, is just, you know, with all these different avalanche centers, you know, even if you're staying up to date on the, you know, current conditions in, in your home area, but you're planning a trip somewhere else, uh, I really recommend, you know, starting to look at the avalanche danger, um, and even just starting to read the forecast in these zones, um, well, before you head into that terrain, you know, it's better to get a good sense and feel the snowpack and the trend, um, before just showing up on the doorstep and trying to figure out as you go. Without further ado, uh, so this is what our website looks like if you've never been to it before. So avalanche.state.co.us, uh, or if you just type in CAIC, it's easy to find. Um, this is our main page. And before I get into anything else, I just wanna highlight this uh, beautiful blue button up here. Um, so it says submit an observation and uh, Justin touched on this, but you know, it's just something I wanna, um, really highlight, you know, our, our forecasts can really be steered and um, a lot of value added to public observation. Uh, you know, I, the zone I cover, or the, the territory I cover is massive, you know, from, from Vail and Summit County all the way through Steamboat and the Flat Tops. Um, and I, you know, there are other forecasters that work at the Avalanche Center that, um, you know, help get out and collect field data. But uh, the more eyes and ears we have out in the field, the more accurate our forecast is going to be. And overall, the, you know, the safer and better, you know, a better product that we can put out. Um, with that, don't be afraid. Like any information is good information. I know when I was, uh, you know, um, in my in my younger years before I worked at the Avalanche Center, I was, I was very hesitant to submit an observation because I didn't want to sound stupid. I didn't want to submit something that wasn't professional. We don't care. We don't judge like that. We are so thankful when people submit any kind of information. Um, pictures are gold, videos are amazing, um, especially if you're seeing avalanche activity. So please send us information. Uh, but digging into it here, so this is the main screen. Uh, the state is broken up into 10 different zones. Um, and you can see just from this page that um, there's a lot of green on the map. We're, we're at low danger pretty much throughout the state, except for uh, amazingly the San Graded Cristos, which is kind of an anomaly right now. But um, to get down to uh, a zone level here, you can just click on this tab and it'll bring up the local zone forecast page. Um, and you can see, you can always check the, the time and date, make sure um, you know that it's populated the right one. But uh, you can see who issued the forecast. I actually was this morning, uh, the forecaster on. Um, but to start off with, and, and I loved how Justin brought this, this um, point up, you know, don't just look at the forecast for what color it is for the day. There, there is much more information you need to be aware of than just, is it green, is it yellow, is it orange? Um, but we do include that information. It is very important, but you need to understand what the different danger ratings mean and how that relates to the terrain the avalanche conditions and you know the uh, the travel advice. So it's broken up in different elevation bands. Um, the really nice thing about our website is any of these blue tabs, you can click on and it'll give you a description if you're not familiar with the uh, the verbiage on the website. Um, so it's a great learning tool in that regard. But as you scroll down, so we have the avalanche danger listed out for the um, current day and then um, what we expect it to be for the uh, um, the next day, uh, we write up a, a summary of the current avalanche conditions, and we try to keep this short and sweet. You know, this is really the bullet points of what you should expect out there, uh, what it looks like, some travel advice, um, terrain that we, you know, think that, uh, you know, current avalanche problems can exist in, um, and what terrain is, is typically a better option for riding. Uh, right now, uh, because we're at low danger, we don't have any problems listed. We actually pulled the problems off the list because at the moment, there's just, there's not enough evidence to really support even one of our avalanche problems. Um, I will click on the sand grids just so you can see that view and I can talk about a few things. But um, the last big important thing is the weather forecast for the day. Um, you can see we had a little clerical error. It's actually not January 1st, 1970. Um, but this is a forecast for 11,000 feet. And just to kind of put some emphasis on, you know, how important weather forecasting is, you know, it, um, weather is really the driving engine for avalanche conditions. And um, to highlight how good of a job my colleagues are that uh, we have, we have um, a staff that works out of our Boulder office. Um, that office is in 
the National Weather Services office. So our forecasting products, our access to some uh, really amazing weather models uh, is pretty incredible. And, and with this, you know, we're forecasting for these specific mountain regions. So we, we really break up the weather forecast uh, into a pretty small slice. And, um, you know, I, I know everybody has their favorite weather stuff, but um, I really I uh, think our guys do an incredible job of putting out accurate weather on a zone level. Um, another thing you can click on here. So the summary, like I said, is just kind of a real short view. The forecast discussion um, is an area where we have a little more latitude to expand on ideas. Um, we try to keep the summary. Um, we try to keep the summary, you know, in kind of basic language, uh, where in the discussion we'll get into maybe a little more jargony stuff. Uh, we can kind of dig into more current conditions, uh, how things are changing. We can also add just different uh, information and material. So I would encourage all you to, you know, I'm up writing this at 4, 4.30 in the morning, and I wonder if people are reading it. So please, please make me feel good and read this so I don't, I don't feel like it's just lost. But um, there's always good information in there. Um, there's all these drop-down menus. Like I said, you can access the different zones by these drop-downs. Um, but just to show you what the problem list looks like um, in a zone that actually has moderate danger. So down here in the Sangres, um, we do list out, you know, when we have an avalanche problem or problems that we're concerned about, we can have multiple of these. Um, we'll list out the avalanche problem. We'll highlight in, this is an avalanche rose, so uh, cardinal direction and then the different elevation bands. So we'll shade in areas where we think this problem is most likely to exist. Uh, this isn't a catch-all. This doesn't mean that this avalanche problem couldn't live on other aspects or other aspects aren't dangerous. Please don't use this as that kind of a tool, but it's it's where we think it most likely exists. Um, and then we give, you know, some input on, you know, how likely it is to trigger it and then the size of the avalanche you're, you're likely to trigger. But, you know, just remember we're, we're forecasting for huge areas. You know, this isn't um, as detailed as we try to get, you know, this is still a, a broad stroke forecast. So you really, um, you know, I encourage all of you to become your own forecasters, um, you know, be able to develop your own kind of weather ideas, uh, get a, a picture of, you know, what avalanche conditions are like on a slope scale um, and apply what we're saying to what you see out in the field. Uh, we'll also include, you know, some um, photos and videos when we have them that are applicable to current conditions. Um, but some other things that, you know, I find really interesting, you know, uh, when I uh, wake up in the morning and I'm uh, plugging in to kind of look at the forecast or how, I'm, how I develop my process, uh, we have a bunch of information here. So outside of uh, field reports and avalanche reports, if you click on this weather station button, we have the whole list of weather stations per zone. So this is current data that you can look at for current conditions. Um, it also, you can change the view. So this is kind of a broad view of the weather. So different elevation bands, temperatures. Um, if there's big temperature differences or a big difference in a category, it'll color code kind of like the avalanche danger. So we can have uh, yellow is kind of like a moderate change. Orange is kind of a considerable change. And then red is a, a significant change in those, um, in those different weather parameters. Uh, you can change the view to get more specific down to, uh, if I want to look at just recent snowfall, I can click on this precipitation tab. Uh, I can organize these different tabs. So if I wanted to look at, um, you know, how deep the snowpack is up in the steamboat zone, I can categorize this and, uh, and see which, which weather stations have the most snow on the ground right now. Uh, I can also look at um, uh, different views of like the, the wind. Uh, and this gives current wind speed uh, and then the previous wind speeds for uh, different time periods. So all these are kind of important factors. You know, when we're, when we're looking at avalanche conditions, some of the main drivers that are creating change are, you know, precipitation. Obviously, when we get more snow, uh, that's going to change avalanche conditions. Uh, the wind is a huge driver of, um, you know, transporting snow from one slope to another. Uh, and then temperature, you know, snow likes to stay cold and that's how we like it. When it gets warm, it does weird, nasty things. Uh, you can look, you can move back in time um, in this tab up here by hours, days, weeks. Um, some other things, you know, if you actually click on one of these weather stations, you can get more of an in-depth view. Uh, you can get all sorts of graphical views of the temperature weather. 
um, and even historic views in a graph here. But click and ride along. Um, the website is packed with more information than you can ever imagine. But a few other things that I really like, uh, as far as like weather forecasting stuff for people that you know really want to dig in uh, on a higher level than just what we're seeing in the Avalanche Bulletin. But actually, um, one you can you can look at the weather uh, that we have broken out. So this is the weather summary. Um, which is great information. And then you can look at all the different weather from um, all the different zones. Uh, but another tool I really like to use is uh, one is this, you know, weather forecasting model. Again, there's a ton of different models out there. Um, we really have everything you need packed into our website uh, to be a very, you know, accurate forecaster in your own, you know, comfort of your own home. Um, but on the left here, so this is the different weather models that we have uh, that you can access from our site. This wharf model is um, is an in-house product that uh, one of our colleagues, one of my friends, um, uh, Dr. John Snook, he's like an Einstein smart, amazing. Uh, he's got a doctorate in meteorology and uh, has been designing weather systems for um, uh, for countries. He just got done building one for Malaysia. I think he's building one for Saudi Arabia. But he developed this wharf model and uh, the regular wharf has got a four kilometer resolution. The high res is a, a two kilometer resolution. But for people that, if this just sounds jargony, um, some simple things you can do uh, to just see even like when we're going to get the next POW day is you can click on, um, even if I want to look at the Colorado view, if I want to look at um, total snow in uh, the next 84 hours, obviously this isn't going to be very interesting because there's not a lot of snow coming in the next 84 hours. but um, this would actually start highlighting, um, that one's not going to be cool. Sorry. <laughs> I'll pick something else. The, uh, the GFS, this is a much longer, um, model forecast run. So 240 hours. So we can see even if the total snow in the next 240 hours, uh, for people that want to do some pow chasing, uh, we can look at the whole United States and see when storms are coming in. So you can see the, uh, the date and timestamp up here. And sadly, it's not looking like we're going to get snow until an entire another week. Um, but I'd encourage you to play around with uh, some of the weather models here. Um, they pretty much can give you all the information you ever need. Another really cool tool is this point forecast. So again, on a zone level, you can look um, at a bunch of different views. Uh, my favorite is this graph view here. So if I want to look at uh, weather conditions at Breckenridge. Um, unfortunately, there's been no precipitation in the last few days, but you know I can see the wind direction in a nicely spelled out graph here. Uh, gives the wind direction up in these arrows, temperature, dew point, and all that kind of stuff. So um, these are all a lot cooler, like I said, when uh, when we actually have a bit more weather going on. Uh, things are pretty stale at the moment, hence the low danger. Um, last few things I'll finish up with uh, before handing this off is. Um, the field report section. So here you can you can see the uh, um, the data that we've collected out in the field. Uh, it kind of gives you a, a two different views. You can click on you know this for the map view. You can scale in and see um, on a uh, you know more referenced area of like where these observations have come in from. Or I find this table view to be a little easier. Um, you can filter this by zone. So if we want to look at the recent uh, observations from the Bell Summit zone here, and then if we click on this tab, it'll pull up uh, what these observations came in. So uh, there was actually a couple small avalanches on this one. Um, you know, most people, this is what we encourage. This is great when people send in pictures like this, you know, even a little bit of loose snow, you can see their tracks. Like we can kind of get a good view of like what the snow packs like in this area. Um, and what these conditions were like. So that's a pretty quick and dirty view of what we got going on here. The last one, um, just recent avalanche activity. This is another nice view of just recent avalanche activity in the state. Uh, again, all this stuff, you know, if you hover over, if you don't know what some of these um, uh, some of the terminology is or what all these different letters and numbers mean, 
if you hover over any of these boxes, it'll uh, it'll tell you what the coding is on all these different um, on all these different avalanches. So anyway, anyone else want to uh, anything that I missed there, gentlemen, that you want me to dig into? No, I think you covered quite a bit there. Thanks so much, Creston. And anyone that didn't see the, the pop-ups there, just, you know, go and explore those things for yourself. We uh, had a couple people saying they couldn't see those pop-up screens. So, you know, just click on those things yourself, visit that CAIC website and check out all those features. You know, we only have time tonight to give you guys a quick run through, highlight a few things, but, but like Creston says, there's a ton. <laughs> so, so definitely, you know, I mean, it's, it, it would take a lifetime to figure out all of the different um, things on that amazing resource. So we encourage you guys to all, you know, start checking that thing, um, you know, daily, you know, maybe weekly. Uh, definitely, you know, if you're in other zones, get familiar with your own local forecasting center. A lot of um, different states have, have great local forecasting centers. Some states have multiple forecasting centers. Here in Colorado, we actually have another one down in Crested Butte. So um, definitely check out those resources. There's, a, there's certainly a lot to offer and it's a lot to figure out. So um, on that note, I'm gonna pass it over to Pat here to kind of run you through some, some other trip planning resources. Again, Creston, thanks so much for that demo. Um, you know, you guys let us know if you have any more questions for Creston on uh, checking the forecast or any of these other guys moving forward. All right, trip planning resources, some of my favorite. Um, I, I have a huge bookshelf of guidebooks and other resources for the backcountry uh, at my home and they often uh, provide great inspiration. So a few of the ones we like, the Beacon guidebooks, they're very nice for kind of uh, small areas such as like Berthet Pass, there's a great uh, Beacon guidebook on, they're smaller, easier to kind of keep in your pack. Um, Falcon Guides is a great uh, publisher as well. Uh, more on kind of larger areas, maybe statewide guides. Get Her Done is uh, Fritz Berry's uh, publishing company. So pretty local here to Colorado. He has three books that kind of span across this state and then also one on Rocky Mountain National Park. That's very interesting. Um, and Dawson's Guides, if you, uh, you guys have heard of Lou Dawson, a uh, great ski mountaineer, uh, mountaineer in general, but he has some great guides say on like the 14ers. Um, uh, we'll highlight some ski descents in there and uh, some great resources. And then Mountaineers Publishing, again, awesome books. If you're headed to a state, say Washington, they have a, a statewide guidebook for, for just Washington. They have one for Colorado, pretty much any state out there. But if I'm traveling around, you know, if I'm heading up to maybe Jackson Hole, I'm going to go into the Teton Mountaineering. I'm going to go to the local shop. I'm going to see what they have, see their local resources, talk to the guys in there, maybe get some information from them. Um, great way to kind of get in the know of the zone before you even head up there. And uh, again, just the guidebooks and resources that sit on my shelf. I just, you know, if I hear or, or see something and get inspired, I'll look it up, find it in a guidebook, and I, it definitely builds some psych. And uh, digital resources, these are some of the, the more uh, ones that I use on a daily basis. So um, blogs are great if you're interested in writing something that's probably been written before. Um, just doing a quick Google search on the line or the area is going to tell you um, a lot about uh, uh, or find out maybe a trip report or something along those lines. Um, social media, again, is great as well. Joining some Facebook groups, maybe some help in zones, uh, maybe to, to find some partners, but social media is going to uh, give you a lot of information on, on specific lines as well. You just have to do the research, uh, get it on Google and, and start typing in. Um, Cal Topo and Hill Map. So Cal Topo is probably the resource I use the most. Hill Map's a very similar uh program to CalTopo. Again, just a, a, a topographical mapping solution um, uses Google uh, Maps, which is nice. So if you're familiar with Google Maps, Hill Map might be a good one for you. Um, Avenza is a mapping tool as well. Um, Justin's a big fan of that one. Um, I've used it several times, but again, just kind of a, a, a digital topographical mapping solution. Rack Up, um, which I'm not too familiar with, and maybe I'll go and learn a bit more about it. Um, Fat map is getting popular, more of a 3D kind of Google Earth type 
uh, software. Um, really good. I know, um, like for example, in Chamonix, France, I, I looked at it on FatMap, and it's just an amazing kind of uh, three-dimensional uh, mapping tool that uh, is pretty impressive to use. Google Earth itself um, is awesome for seeing a three-dimensional um, uh, aspect of what you want to look at in the backcountry. So we're looking, we're going to be going through Caltapa, which is you know two D. Um, sometimes we, it's a great idea to look at. Uh, the uh, the zone that we're going to with Google Earth and really get a, a kind of a three dimensional view uh, of the terrain we'll be in, and then Gaia. Gaia is probably the second um, resource I use the most, um, and it's very similar to Cal Topo um, in terms of what it can do. But just another great mapping solution. Powder Project again, great way uh, resource to find lines to maybe. Uh, I know on there you'll find kind of uh, objectives and then maybe a Google map that go along with it. And then uh, MVUMs, which one's that, Ben? Those are motor vehicle use maps. So those are very important. If you ever travel in the national forest, um, it is your responsibility to know where you're allowed to be and where you're not allowed to be. A lot of areas are mixed use. So a motor vehicle use map you can find at your local forest service station or, or online. And a lot of those are actually compatible with Avenza now. So you can download where you're allowed to be, whether you're in the summer or the winter, and just make sure that you're not, say, taking you know, a, a snowmobile into a wilderness area, something like that. Awesome. So again, some great resources. There's a lot of different tools out there and a lot of them are very similar. So just, I'd say try a few and see which one you like the best. Um, but I'm going to run through the two I like to use as well as Google Earth. And then Map and Compass, the old standby, a great uh, tool to use. If you're not familiar with how to use a Map and Compass, uh, it's definitely an important tool. Say you're out in the backcountry, we rely so much on our smartphones for using uh, topo maps in the backcountry. So Great to have a backup map and compass, maybe take a class on it, orienteering. Uh, Justin's a great resource on that. He's uh, super into map and compass, something I need to brush up into uh, quite a bit myself. So again, just having uh, the knowledge how to use a map and compass is really important. All right, plan your route. So I'm gonna take, take the screen here. All right, so what I have up here, because everybody see my screen? Yep. All right, so I'm, I have CalTopo here. Again, it's just caltopo.com, really easy. And they have an app for uh, iPhone and Android. Um, I use it all the time. It's probably the most used app on my phone. Um, and uh, again, it's a, just a topographical map uh, software. Um, for a while, it was just web-based, but they've uh, come out with an app in the last few years, and it's, it's just an easy way to, uh, to find where you want to ride. So you bring up CalTopo here, and you know if we're thinking about where we want to ride, um, we're going to think of the location, and we're, we're able to type it up, type it in here. So I'm going to, you know, I don't want to spot burn too bad. I'm just going to do a popular area in Colorado. Everybody already knows, and that's Loveland Pass. Uh, so I can just type in. Loveland Pass, and it'll probably just know Colorado, and it's going to pinpoint me there. It's pinpointing me right on the uh, summit or the pass right there. Um, so as we can see, it kind of defaults to this map builder topo. Um, there's tons of different layers and all these different overlays. So we'll go through the few that I like. Um, one thing I have here, if you notice, I'm logged in with my uh, Facebook account, and I encourage everybody to kind of log in with your account because you're able to save maps, and that's really important if you're going to save a map. Um, you know, I have maps, for example, of areas I ride, uh, you know, I have uh, maps of ski mountaineering lines um, in, say, a whole county or a whole mountain range that I save, and it's easy for me to just pull that up. And if I know the, the day's forecast, and I know the avalanche report, I can look at a lot of different options and really get my, uh, the objective for the day in line with the, the forecast, the weather, what my partners want to do, everything we've kind of talked about. So I, uh, it's really nice to have kind of a resource of your own um, for that. But again, look over here in map layers um, with what I really like to turn on immediately. So the most, the base layers I use the most, I like Map Builder Topo. And I really like some of the Google layers, especially terrain. 
And I also like satellite even a bit better. So satellite's gonna give me the ability to just see the terrain. So the topo is great, but I don't know where tree cover is. Uh, I don't know where rocks are. So if I pull up satellite, I can really get an in-depth view of the terrain that we'll be in. And you know, I, I, if I'm gonna plan a route, I don't wanna you know, wind it through a bunch of tree terrain if I can stay out in the open or, or something like that, if the uh, terrain dictates that. So, you know, I like to stick it in topo um, for a lot of the time, but if I'm really looking towards uh, getting intimate with the terrain itself, I'll pull it up in satellite. But one of the biggest things I use and always have turned on is just slope angle shading. So this tool is probably one of the more important tools we can use in our trip planning because it's simply gonna highlight avalanche terrain for us, which is really important. So it starts down here and assigns a color to different slope angles, um, starting at 27 degrees, which is light yellow. So 27 to 29, light, light yellow, 30 to 31, we're getting into avalanche terrain. Uh, is a light orange, orange 32 to 34, 35 to 45 uh, prime time avalanche terrain in red, and then even higher into the blue and purple 46 to 50. You know, once we get above that 50 degrees, we're getting to terrain where a lot of times the, the snow just simply doesn't stick to it. Um, so that's kind of why they don't highlight that terrain. Usually it'll just come up as black. Um, so, you know, that typically means a vertical rock face of some sort. Um, so I'll keep this on. And, you know, if I'm going to start a tour here and you know we're going to start from the pass and i'll just throw it into satellite here if i have it in satellite so we can see where we're parked in here i like to turn on the contours just so i can see the the contours of the land um so say we're going to start our tour we figured out the avalanche forecast i'm just gonna you know our avalanche forecast is pretty low right now in terms of danger but there's not a whole lot of snow out here so i'm just going to envision that we're in a midwinter day here in Colorado, which is typically that, you know, yellow moderate. So avalanche issues, deep persistent weak slabs, um, uh, weak layers, I'm sorry. Uh, and so we're probably going to be sticking to terrain that is below 30 degrees. So let's just uh, think about uh, planning a tour up here in avalanche uh, terrain free uh, zone. So we'll start here at the, the parking lot. Um, and there's a bunch of different tools that we can use over here to uh, objects and layers. Um, and I like to use the line to really plan our tour in terms of how we're gonna do the approach. So again, we can see our avalanche terrain here and we can see that we're kind of on a ridge right here. So for me, if I see a ridge and I, I can stay off the avalanche terrain on either side, I'm probably gonna go up that. Um, so I'm just going to turn it back into map filler topo because I know we're not going to be in any uh, treat area. This is all open. So I'll kind of start in the parking lot and kind of work my way up the ridge, kind of keeping uh, how we're going to tour. And again, we're staying off uh, steep terrain here. And we're also able to uh, figure out our terrain statistics once I kind of match this line or finish it up, I should say. Um, so maybe we want to come up here to almost the summit here. And you notice I kind of stayed off steep terrain. So we got to think about skinning. You know, we, we don't want to skin on very steep terrain. If we are, we're going to have to be doing sw switchbacks. So if we're staying on a ridge, we can look at the, the slope angle shading and make sure it's in line with what we can actually skin. Um, so I'm going to make that the approach right there. And I'm just going to label it um, approach one. And it's going to map it uh, or plot it onto the map for me. And it's going to put it over here in lines and polygons. And so I'm able to just store it on the map. I can click it and I can look at, I can edit it. But some of the, the best things is I can look at the terrain statistics. It's going to tell me how long that is. I can click on it. It's going to tell me how much elevations gained or lost, the slope angle average, the aspect, the tree cover. Uh, well, again, we're on, not on any here. And just the type, type of land cover. So a lot of different uh, statistics that are super helpful. And that's just kind of getting an eye uh, or getting an idea of, of the terrain before we're even out there. So if I'm planning a trip to Loveland Pass and I've never even been there, if I really start here in the trip planning uh, phase, uh, I'm going to have a better idea of what I'm, where I'm at uh, while I'm out there, especially when I put this onto my phone and have a, a copy out there in the field. Um, okay, so we made it to the top of the summit here. 
So we have a few options. Um, maybe we want to stay off this steep train here. So we have our, our baseline approach. And then maybe I'll, I'll if, just looking at the terrain, looking at the contours, this looks like a, a good run here. And maybe if we were able to get into maybe some just lower, or I'm sorry, less steep avalanche terrain, this might be a good one. So we have two different kind of options up here, uh, north and south facing. So, you know, the snowpack is going to be very different. It's going to give us an idea of, give us an, the ability up on this ridge, say, to uh, look at the snowpack on either side. So maybe I'll plot a run here, say uh, run one. So this is gonna give us our first option. And I'm sorry, I'm not gonna use a line here. I'm gonna use a polygon. And I like to change the colors. So I'm gonna use blue here. So maybe while we're up here at the summit, I'm gonna kind of look at the terrain a little bit differently. We have these little pockets, um, just little terrain features and I can highlight those. I'm just going to kind of plot a run down to say here. And kind of connect it. I'm just gonna label that option one. So there we kind of have a, a run plotted. So, uh, we're, what we're doing now is making plan A, B, C's, maybe multiple runs in a tour, that kind of thing. Um, and when we come in here, even if I really wanted to get in depth, I could even highlight the avalanche screen within this with just other polygons. So maybe I'll use orange here. And orange is kind of already in there. So we'll use red again. Maybe we could just highlight the avalanche terrain that I see. You know, these might be rocks too, if I put it in satellite, but just kind of show any of the concept of it. And, oh, I'm using, am I using a line? I think I am. I can finish it. Where did my, okay. Sorry about that, got a little ahead of myself here. So again, I'm just drawing a polygon around the avalanche terrain, just as an example of how I can highlight this on my topo. And I'll just label that maybe like no-go. So I have a run and then I can kind of highlight individual features within it um, that I want to stay away from. Maybe there's trees, maybe I can stick it back in here in satellite. And as we see there, um, yeah, just like a steeper section of the slope, but that's going to give us the ability to see if it's actually like a tree or something, um, or maybe a cliff. Um, but I'm going to throw it back in a topo here and maybe we want to have another approach here. Um, for where we started, across the ridge, you know, and if, like I said, maybe we could get into, uh, based on the forecast for the day, maybe we could ride some southern aspects that might look good, um, just theoretical. I'm going to label this approach two. And again, I can click on that, get the terrain st uh, statistics, and then maybe plot another polygon here. Maybe we would like have an option for a south facing run. So this is kind of like a little bowl here. Maybe all the way down here into the meadow. Looks like a little cliffy section. So we'll go around that. All right. So there's run two. So, you know, this is kind of what I'll do and, and break down a zone when I want to go out there. Um, even like I said, before I, if, before I even go out there, it's, I'm able to just plot it on a, a Cal Topo map. And I'm a, you know, when I'm driving through an area, I'm rubbernecking and I just look up and I see maybe a cool line that I'm, would be a really great idea. The first thing I do is just pulled up in Cal Topo and, and look at it on the Topo map and get a more intimate idea. And then I start plotting 
uh, A, Bs, and Cs in that zone and really get intimate uh, before I get out there. Um, so this is kind of the baseline of what I'll do, uh, approaches, descents, um, the runs, and maybe even the out. So we see here like a trail, for example, maybe that's a good place um, to kind of have an exit if we were to go on option one uh, back to the trail. Um, again, staying away from avalanche train if we need to. I could just label that exit. So once I have this map um, kind of labeled up and have my run list and kind of uh, uh, maybe terrain traps, maybe uh, anything I want to stay away from in terms of steep terrain or trees or whatever else uh, based on the forecast and uh, what we want to ride, um, I could save it. Hey, Pat, will you show a marker real quick too? Oh, sure. Yep. Thanks, buddy. So a marker is great. Um, for just kind of plotting uh, maybe a place, maybe we dug a pit somewhere. Maybe I want to submit it to the CIC forecast. You know, maybe I dug a pit right here. I can add a marker to this. Okay. Why is it not letting me click the style? I'm sorry. I'm... There it is. Okay. Can add a marker. Maybe I dug a pit here. I can save it. And that way I know, uh, you know, where this is uh, for the future or a reference. Uh, maybe it's just, maybe I found a cool shack in the backcountry. I can mark it on the map. Um, many different things we could use markers for. Um, so I guess that was the one I did originally. I'll go ahead and delete that. Um, so, yeah. This is kind of what I'll do for a zone, like I said. And anything else you want to see, Ben? Did I miss anything? I think I'm good on my end. Justin, you see anything there you want to uh, pat to add? Killer resource. Uh, it's all you hop on here. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to reiterate that that marker is a great function to use. So if you're staying at a hut, like Pat said, a shack, or maybe if you're camping and you need that lat launch to give to you, uh, to let somebody know where you're going, that's going to show you the, the exact coordinates, especially the huts. And so the markers are great. And you can also use markers to mark trailhead locations, uh, parking areas. Um, and so, yeah, the markers are a great function as well. Pat did it, hit it, hit Caltopia pretty good. I think the, the lines, the polygons, and the markers are going to be the three most common um, things you add onto that map. Right. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and save this map. So say, you know, we're planning a tour for tomorrow. We've looked at the avalanche forecast. We've looked at the weather. We've talked to our partners about what kind of terrain we want to ride. We went ahead and say the trip leader, uh, maybe we designated somebody to, although we want to all discuss this, but maybe we designated somebody to kind of make a Cal Topo map. And they all want to send this to all my partners. Hey, this is where, you know, I had an idea of where to go. Maybe get some good discussion going. So I can go ahead and just save this map. I'm just going to call it Loveland Pass. Slay it home. And I can make it a URL. So anybody with the URL, maps URL can view it. I can make it private, public. I can send it maybe to everyone that I know, you know, tell us whatever you kind of want to do with it. But I went ahead and saved it. So now it's going to show up. And I'm, again, I'm logged in here with my Facebook account. It's going to show up here. And I can click it. And here's my URL for it. So I can just copy and paste this and send it off in an email um, to a buddy and say, hey, check this out. This is what we were thinking for tomorrow. Um, let me know what you think, um, if it's in line with what you want to do in the backcountry. Um, so a great tool, easy to share. Um, but say, you know, I have this CalTopo app on my phone. I need to get it on my phone for tomorrow's tour. The nice thing about CalTopo, though, is once you save this to your account, if you have the app, and I believe it's in the paid version, which I think is about $20 a year. So pretty nominal. Um, it's going to show up in there already. Uh, it's going to show up in the map. It's going to load as long as you have an internet, active internet connection. And the one thing when we go in the backcountry with any of these apps is we want to make sure we download the maps and our maps. So we need to, the, the app itself probably isn't going to download the map of the actual area. So if I want the map builder topo for a certain 
place, I need to download that data to my phone. Unless I have an active internet connection uh, in the backcountry, it's not going to load the map. So if I know I'm going somewhere with no cell service, I need to make sure I download the area, the map for that area, uh, which you can do uh, through the settings. Um, again, they have great resources for that for any app. Um, but that way I can view the map and then I can import the map into it. But say I'm going to, my buddy uses Gaia. So I need to go ahead and, and export it for him. Um, I can go here and hit just export GPX. I can check, uh, see it defaults and checks everything that I've plotted. So the map or the polygons, the markers, the points. Um, and I can, you know, maybe if I wanted to uncheck a few things, um, I could do that, but I can go ahead and export it. So here, this is saved to my computer, the GPX file. And say my friend uses Gaia, um, I could send it to him via email. He could open it up in Gaia, um, import the maps. But I'm gonna jump over here just to, to Gaia web-based version. And if I want to import the map, I can go to my user. I'm logged in here again with my account. All these things, you wanna make a, an account so it's gonna track and you can save maps and all, everything else with it. So I can go ahead and upload. Select it from my computer here. Found the GPX, importing it, and boom. Right here is the exact thing I mapped, just in a totally different uh, topographical software. So it, any, you know, if I'm using Avenza or Gaia, all these things are going to span because all they are are, are they're just plotting points. They're, they're just a, a, a big data set. So once you import it in another tool, it's going to populate it, you know, obviously using its graphical interface. Um, but this is the way Gaia plots it. So a little bit different than uh, CalTopo, um, but essentially the same thing. And I'm just going to jump back into uh, CalTopo again, just to reiterate uh, before I finish it up with that. The slope angle shading, super important. Probably one of the, the biggest tools we have uh, for navigating through Avalanche Train. Not only of where we want to ride, but where we where do we want to stay away from? You know, if I know there's a runout zone from this peak here, maybe I want to. I need to pull my my skin track way away. Um, so it just gives us a good intimate look into the terrain we're gonna uh, view. And you know, like again, I have all these maps. So if I want to say. The, this is what I'm really psyched on is making maps for places, you know, you can plot your lines and really get an idea. Say I want to go out somewhere the next day and I know the avalanche forecast. I have so many options that I can get my objective in line with the weather and the, uh, the avalanche forecast. Right. So again, we'll jump over here to Gaia. Any questions on CalTopo before I run through this? I'm not going to run through this as, as much as CalTopo, just because I, I think CalTopo is one of the best resources, the one I know the best. But Gaia is very, very similar and, and one I used uh, as the primary app on my phone before CalTopo came out with an iPhone app. Any questions? Ben, we good? Wonderful. Justin, you got anything else to add there? Let me unmute myself here. No, I think I just typed it. The only thing I had to add in the chat box, uh, these slope angle tools are great resources to use, but we only need to make sure that it's not our end all decision making tool. So with using these resources and I'll hit out here in a second is just continually observing the field, these slope angles as well. So just don't get, don't get stuck in the thought process. This is going to show everything. It's going to show you things based on those contours. Those contours are 40 feet apart. So if you, encounter what we call micro train, it might not register on these sort of resources. And so you need to continually make sure you're verifying in the field. Yep. Excellent point, Justin, something I missed and something that I try to stress each time. Yeah. The, these are just a general guideline. So not exact. Um, okay, great. So we'll jump Pat, over here to Gaia. Pat, I got a couple um, from CalTopo real quick. Sure. Eric Sandberg is requesting that you show him how to use the profile um, function on CalTopo. You familiar with that one? Profile. Okay. Maybe. Right. Eric, Justin, yeah, are you familiar you, with that? Yeah. Yeah. You just did the terrain statistics. So just click on whichever you want. Like, oh, that profile. I got gotcha. you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So, very similar. Going to give us our distance. Um, kind of the same data it's going to give us in the, the, the terrain statistics, but um, profile great. 
Um, and and th this kind of data we can you know use the what's called the Mutter scale. Justin's really familiar with that on and it kind of determining how long it's going to take to do this approach. Um, what is it about a thousand feet per hour, a mile and a half per hour? The Mutter yep. scale. Yeah, and I and I went ahead and typed it in the chat box. Ben and I were going back and forth on that already. But yeah, it's a good the Mutter time scale is good. It can get a little in depth. Uh, but a good general plan for winter travel is most people tour about a mile to two miles an hour. Uh, and that can vary. You know, if you're breaking trail of two feet of snow, you might be more in the mile to a mile and a half an hour range. Whereas if you're on a forest service road and it's completely packed, you might be more to the two mile an hour range. So that's just a good starting point. And then, like you said, Pat, for every thousand foot in elevation you gain, you usually want to tack on an hour to it. So it's just good for time planning. You know, if you want to ski in east facing Kular in springtime, you know, it's going to start softening up at a certain time. You back up that time scale and leave at that time. Um, so that's great. The other question we saw on there is, can you share your Cal Topo similar to share drive on folder where you guys can all work on it together? Yes, absolutely. So Pat just showed you guys how to save that map. You save that map. There you go. Pat's doing it. And then you can share the the link to that map and you guys can all work on it real time you know i could be sitting right. here in dillon colorado going out with buddy in denver colorado tomorrow and we can be both working on that map together um so definitely something to, to utilize right and it's going to be with a url here so we just want to save it as view with url and that way anybody with this url can pull it up um and then add some stuff Yep. but it's going to be one saved more. with your account Sorry, cut you off there, Pat. Uh, somebody was asking about the wind feature on Caltopo. If you want to just go ahead and click that map layer to show them that as well. Right. And that uh, the sun feature. So you can see when the sun's shining, when. Is that wind? Is that, is that Google Earth? That's more Google Earth, but there is a wind. Under, on one under, of your layers. under map overlays, under forecasts, it has wind plot. Ooh. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So Caltopo uh, is an ever an ever evolving tool here. These guys are great. They are here for the betterment of our community, and this resource just keeps getting better and better every year. And so these actually are new features within the past couple of years, the past few years actually. Yeah, I need to look at this avalanche one. That one's probably interesting. Okay. Um, and again, just to stress before I jump over to Gaia here. Map your zones. We all ski the same zones. And for years, I would just go out there and get lost each time and not do the same exit. So dial your zones, get run lists. If you ride the same thing, your buddies are going to know those runs. Name them funny names. You know, if you like Seinfeld, use Seinfeld names, you know, map your exits. How often do we get lost and into a gully that we should never get down? We have to put our skins back on map our exit so if we're unsure where we are we just pull it up in our cal topo app and look exactly where we are look at where the exit is and and modify our course so really really powerful and you know really can help the backcountry experience a lot um okay great so i'm going to come over here to gaia i've imported this map and i'll just kind of show you how you use these uh different tools in here so again um can I do it on this map? Let's see. I need to add the point. Excuse me, I haven't used this one in a minute. Maybe if I exit out of the map, it should give me the ability to add polygons, but it's not right now. Just going to load Gaia without the map that I imported. Okay, so again, we're over here in Loveland Pass, and here are the tools over here. Um, say I want to add a waypoint, that's just a marker, so I could add one up here on the summit. Save it. And again, create a route. This is just like using uh, lines in um, Caltapo, so very similar. And I can just draw the line in just like I kind of did. It's going to give me those terrain statistics in a nice format. Um, I'm just going to go up to here. Again, that's kind of our similar approach. And then 
Um, again, going to give us our direction uh, that we use. So uh, quite a nice graphical interface in Gaia. And then area, these are our polygons. So again, similar to what we use, maybe we want to make a run here. I could just draw it in. It has this nice feel right with the contour lines. Oop. Maybe that was not the best one. Use the backspace. This might not be the best looking polygon here. So excuse me, but you see area is invalid. Let me see, I'm just gonna cancel this one and make a new one. There we go. We'll just make that polygon. Go ahead and save it. Call it a run. So very similar to what we did in CalTopo. Um, and then exporting it. Um, so again, just like GPX file, saved to my uh, computer, called it run. Uh, I guess it uses the default name. But again, very similar to CalTopo. Um, so you can explore the tools here. But, you know, as you see, the three main tools I use in CalTopo are like the three main tools here. Areas, routes, markers, or waypoints. So that's our marker, our line, and our polygon, essentially. So why Anything would else? people want to use Gaia, right? Why is Gaia the second step here? I wouldn't call it the second step. Um, I think it's just a preference on the mapping solution you like. I think there, is there layers? Does anybody know, Justin, for uh, CalTopo in Gaia? I believe they do support CalTopo they, layers. I know I know they have a slope angle shading. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of experience with Gaia. I, I personally use CalTopo into Avenza, um, but that was one of the questions we just had. And, and I know Gaia did just recently add slope angle shading. Right, and that was kind of my point, Pat, that Gaia is what you would use to actually track yourself in the field as a GPS function, right? Where like you'd have it on your phone or can you have CalTopo also, you know, is there a tracking feature on CalTopo? I believe CalTopo does tracking, yes. Cool. But I would have to check on that. What I use is my watch and that way it doesn't drain my battery and my phone. Um, and then I kind of look at both. Um, so that's just kind of my way of how to do it. Um, but yeah, Gaia does have a great tracking feature. The one thing is you just gotta, you gotta bring some batteries out for your phone because I know it uses a lot of juice, um, especially when it's cold. So something to keep in mind. Yep. So, so CalTopo does have an app and along with their web-based, uh, program, they've been improving their app. So Ryan did just mention that CalTopo did add a tracking system to their app. Um, and so personally, I just want to plug Avenza real quick. I'm a huge fan of Avenza. It's super simple. And it's basically just an offline mapping tool on my phone. And so what I will do is I'll create my tour plan on CalTopo. And then basically on CalTopo, you get a print the PDF and it pops up a map and it has a little QR code in the bottom corner. And I just hop on my phone onto Avenza. And technology is magic. I hold my phone and it just does this QR scan weird thing. And it basically brings that CalTopo right onto my phone and it's an offline map. So I can be not in any sort of cell service as long as I'm in that zone I had planned in my CalTopo and it'll use a geospatial PDF. So it'll literally blue dot you. I don't know if you guys have seen that before, but that blue dot will be where you are pretty much at in, in that location. So you can look at your map and look at your blue dot like, oh crap. Yeah, off, off to the right there. Remember we closed that area because there's that big a terrain trap or that big steep slope. And so for me, and that's what I use in our avalanche courses, uh, there can be no substitute for map and compass to throw that out there. Um, but the event uh, utilizing that because it is an offline mapping tool with a geospatial PDF, we've seen that to be a great resource. Right, and I do the same thing with Gaia. I'll download you know, a map like this and then even if I'm out of service, it, you know, it still functions the same way. Is that similar to what you're talking about, Justin? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. And you can also record on Avenza too. 
do you even record your track, get an idea of how long you're at, how much elevation you gain, what your average elevation or your average slope angle was. And you can also take photos. Like if I dug a pit in a certain area, I could take a photo of it. And I can plot it on that map, which is pretty cool as well. I'm pretty sure you can do the same thing on Gaia. Yeah, yeah maybe we can see my phone a little bit. I guess not. It's kind of, but we see I have my Caltopo up here. And, you know, I, I can bring up my map list that we were just looking at. Um, you see a little bit there. Load them on. Like I said, all I really want to need to do is make sure I download the map layers because our, our phone isn't going to store um, the physical map unless I have it downloaded or an active internet connection. Um, and I don't have to do anything. So my maps are already uploaded, automatically uploaded to the, the app itself. So I don't even have to export anything. It just shows up, which is a nice yeah. feature. Yeah, that's awesome. Killer so, Pat. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, I think, you know, you pick the app that you like and you just get really uh, uh, educated on how to use it. And, you know, for me, Caltapa works. Justin loves the Venza. You know, they all are great tools and pretty much all the same thing theoretically. Um, and as you see how easy it is to export and import that same data in between them. So that's all that really matters. Okay, great. Any other questions about Gaia? I'm just going to run through Google Earth because this is an awesome tool as well, and I'll import a map there. Send it, buddy. Good. Okay, great. So, you know, I have Google Earth Pro here. There's a web-based version. This is the desktop version. Um, and, you know, looking at that 2D map is great, but if I really want to see the terrain in a three-dimensional uh, perspective, there's nothing better than Google Earth. You know, it's not the end all be all it's going to show you every single uh terrain uh feature um but it's a great general tool so you know i just exported that or i'm sorry exported a gpx what we want to do for google earth is export a km kml file and you see right here i have my map up uh still and i can ex export the kml for google earth again export it check all that i want go ahead and download it to my computer and then I can go ahead and open it. So here it is. And it just mapped it on for me in a in Google Earth. Exactly what I mapped on uh, Caltapo. <laughs> and I could go ahead and just see my run. Did I make a good run? You know, that was pretty general, but this looks okay. I highlighted some of this steeper terrain here. But now we can kind of see the terrain in a more three-dimensional perspective. You see here our route up. The ridge kind of makes sense when we look at it a three-dimensional um, perspective. We can look at it here, uh, you know, our approach to kind of across the ridge where I plotted the snow pit. And then again, on our south facing run, I, I mapped and really get a good bird's eye view of the terrain using Google Earth. Um, and I can even map on this. I really like mapping on a 2D and then bringing it into Google Earth. I think it's just a, a better workflow for me. Um, but an amazing tool um, that, again, one that I underutilized for a while. Um, these mapping tools are really important and really gives you a whole lot of power when you're in the backcountry to, to be aware of where you are and your surroundings and exits and entrances and uh, just not getting lost because I've gotten lost so many times. We all have. It's, it's very frustrating. Um, so yeah, any anything specific you want me to run through Google Earth? Maybe Ben or Justin? That's all uh, I got. Maybe the sun. Pat, Pat I had a here. question for you. Do you ever sure. um, do you ever import the uh, slope angle shading um, maps into uh, into Google Earth? That's one of my favorites as well. I haven't done that. I'd be I'd be psyched to learn. So maybe you can show me real quick. Yeah, I can do that real quick. Um, yeah, let me. I'll pull up a Cal Topo here. Yeah, this is one of my favorites too. Uh, I'll take over the screen here real quick. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, actually, awesome. Stop other screen sharing. Yeah, I can uh, stop mine real quick. I think I might have just bulldogged you there. I don't know if that worked or not. <laughs> See, I'm going to learn something today. And that's why I'm psyched to be in this Slay at Home series, you know? Yeah. This is just one of my go to's night. You know, everything you guys describes, all the tools that I use as well on a daily basis. Um, you know, Cal Topo and Avins are like, you know, th those are my two favorites. Um, but if we just pop up to uh, this is just Vail Pass here. So if I turn on the um, 
slope angle shading feature. Uh, and again, I appreciate your, you know, what you said, Justin, about, you know, these, these are a great reference tool, but you know, the accuracy in this isn't, you know, worth betting your life on, you know, you do need to uh, prove this out in the field. Um, but if you, if you just go up to um, print and then um, download KMZ file here for Google earth, It'll then populate a, a section. And can you guys all see this this time? I, I, I saw I didn't see the pop-ups last time. So sorry about the uh, geek in it when I was run, running through the um, Avalanche stuff. Um, you can change, you can move this around um, and print up the, the section that you want. And then over here on the left-hand tab, if you just download that KMZ file, similar process, it's just hidden under that print button. Uh, and then I open this in Google Earth. And then hoping my computer will make some magic happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one is hidden in there because I haven't used the print button, I think. And it's kind of hidden, that, yeah. but then, then this is really one of my favorite things. So then we can get that. And you can import. You can do the same deal with. Um, I think I think because they're, you're, they're using two screens, Creston. Oh, is this not showing then? Yeah, it's probably just sharing the main screen you're on, and that might have been the issue before. Okay, let me uh, let me see if I give me one second. Uh, can you see the Google Earth image now? Yep, awesome. Okay, great, cool. So that just loaded into Google Earth, and then you kind of get best of both worlds here. So. Um, Another cool thing with this, so this uh, this little transparency button over here, this opacity, this is like one of my favorites. So then I can kind of roll back through. I can look at you know Google Earth's uh, actual imaging, and then I can just slightly overlay that Cal Topo slope angle shading stuff, and it really draws out the two features. Uh, so for instance, you know I can really you know investigate these cliff bands kind of get a view of like, okay, yeah, that is steep terrain there. Sweet. All right. That is definitely a feature I'd want to avoid. And, uh, you know, like you guys described, I mean, from, from sitting at home, you can plan out a trip and identify all the hazards and everything you need to, um, to operate safely. Cool. Awesome. Sorry, sorry to jump you on that one, but that was one of my favorites. That was that's super it. cool. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna use that. Um, cool. No, that's great. And uh, yeah, like like Justin and, and Preston said, we use these all the time. Like in the winter, or even for anything, I'm using Caltopo every day. I mean, I, if I see a cool terrain in the distance, the first thing I do when I get home is just look at it on Caltopo and see, oh, is there riding out there? Is there cool lines? Is there maybe a safe winter time zone that's lower angle, you know, it's a really cool tool to just give you a, a snapshot uh, of, of that terrain in a, a really accurate manner. Sweet. And then I just want to highlight, we just had one of our uh, participants mention that with, cause there's su subscriptions to Caltopo. Um, and so with one of the, with the subscription, it looks like you can, get your slope angle shading on Google or with it without downloading the KMZ file. I personally haven't used that before. So that, that's awesome. Um, cool guys. So now we have a pretty good understanding of where it all starts. We assembled our group. We looked at the weather forecast. We looked at the avalanche forecast. We've developed our tour plan. Now we meet the trailhead. It's time to get outside and have some fun. Yeehaw. It's important to understand that it's not over quite yet. And so we do our plan, but we need to make sure that we're continually making observations while out in the field. And we kind of hit on a few of these already. Um, so you want to use that cool little neck feature you got, look around, look, feel, smell, taste, poke, prod, scratch, get intimate with your terrain here. So we like to, to break our uh, field observations into four different categories here, whether it's snowpack, terrain, and the new team. Uh, so some of the key observations for each of those, we'll start with weather. So we're, when we're out in the field, we want to continually observe the weather. Some of the key things we're going to observe for weather, look up, look at the sky. Is it sunny? Is it overcast? Is it what the forecast told us what it was going to be? So what is the sky cover? Next thing is the wind. Like Crescent said, the wind is the architect of our snowpack. Uh, and so is it the wind blowing? If the wind is blowing, where is it coming from? That's going to tell us potentially where, if there is snow for transport, where, is, where it's loading onto. Um, so looking around, looking up at the ridge tops, looking at the trees, you might have some micro wind, some micro terrain. So 
Is it windy? Where is the wind coming from? Is there snow for transport for it to load onto? Precipitation. Is there anything coming out of the sky? If so, what is it? Is it rain? Is it snow? Is it sleet? It's, rain. it's not supposed to rain in the winter. That's why I live in Colorado. And hopefully climate change doesn't change that. Um, so snowfall, how much has snowed? What's the rate? What's the accumulation? So those are some, some good weather observations to keep in mind. Uh, next thing we'll talk about snowpack and snowpack observations. A lot of the times will be dictated by the uh, likely avalanche problem you're going to encounter in the field for the day. Uh, so here in Colorado, we are in a continental snowpack more often than not dealing with a persistent avalanche problem. So some of those key observations, I'm looking for cracking and lumping in the snowpack. I'm doing quick pull probes, quick hand shears to look and see, am I able to find strong layers over weak layers? Um, for wind, am I encountering any wind slabs poking around? Do I hear any auditory symbols, that drummy sound? Visual indicators, do I see some uh, surface snow that looks like it's been disturbed by the snow? What the wind is going to do is going to pack these crystals all tightly together and create wind slabs. Um, so again, the snowpack observations you're going to make are really going to be more so dictated by the likely avalanche problems you're going to encounter for the day. If it's springtime, a whole different set of observations I'm going to be making. I'm more clued into wet observations, right? Looking for pinwheels, looking for roller balls, looking for warming and grabbing the snow surface, picking it up, squeezing it. Is there water dripping out of my hand? All right, that's more clued into wet slab or uh, loose wet avalanche problems. So continually observing the snowpack. And again, a lot of those observations will be in direct relation to the likely avalanche problems you're going to encounter for the day. Uh, and then next thing is terrain. Uh, as Pat mentioned, slope angle. Slope angle is one of our biggest indicators if, if we were in or near avalanche terrain. And it's not only the slope that you're on, slope that you're near. Am I underneath a big slope that's, under, that's above a 30 degree slope angle, right? So most avalanches happen from 30 to 45 degrees. So continually observing your slope angle. So for me, my inclinometer is also my compass and that lives in my hip, pack, the hip pocket of my backpack. It's probably one of the most used tools in my backpack, continually pulling it out and reading slope angles. Uh, so slope angles, another thing we're looking at for terrain is vegetational clues. Uh, am I in a recent avalanche path looking at trees for flagging? Am I sitting here looking at smaller trees within a certain area and everywhere else is big old growth? There's probably a reason why that happens. It's probably due to avalanches. So looking at vegetational clues. Some other things for terrain to think about and clue into. Um, first and foremost, am I on the aspect and elevation that the avalanche forecast forecasted for, right? Um, other things for terrain. Are there any terrain traps around? A terrain trap is anything that can increase the consequence of being caught in an avalanche. Am I above cliffs? Are there trees below me where if I did get caught in a slide, I'm going to go straight into those cheese grater trees? Is there a big uh, gully below me where if I even a smallest slide happens, I'm going to go into that gully and what's going to happen is that snow is going to keep piling and piling and piling on top of me. All right, so continually think of what is the consequence if something were to happen right here. Uh, other things for terrain, trigger points. Am I near any trigger points, any convex rolls, any trees, any cliffs, any cornices, shallow spots in the snowpack? So continually observing that as well. Um, and so those are some of our big terrain uh, observations. Again, slope angle, vegetational clues, trigger points, terrain traps. And there was a question earlier, aspect elevation. Um, some aspects are going to be more prone to sun exposure. Some aspects are going to be more prone to wind. Um, and so just relating that to the forecast and again, from continually making these observations. Um, and then beyond that, we'll get into the, the team here, continually working together as a team. One person shouldn't be, be the one making the decisions. We're making these decisions as a team. Teamwork makes a dream work. I continually say it and I'm a firm believer that teamwork and communication are our two best friends while traveling into the backcountry. All right. So continually talk to your crew. Did you guys see this? Did you see that wind slab over there? Did you guys feel that strong over week? Did you guys see that cracking off on my skis? What do you guys think about that wind loading over there? All right. Other things. How are you all feeling? You guys want to stop, take a break? If your buddy's sweating, sometimes you might just have to, all right, I'm thirsty. I'm going to stop and take a break. Uh, if you're talking to some, if you're talking to your partner and they're taking big gas with air in between, maybe stop or slow down. So just continually working together. Because that person who's there taking breaths, they are no longer going to be a contributor to your group because they're just focused on keeping up. So really just working together to make these decisions. 
So again, just recapping, wanted to make sure that we're continually making these observations in the field. It doesn't end with our tour plan. We get in the field, we have different options, option A, option B, option C. And some of these observations might dictate what option we choose, all right? So super important, don't just get stuck in the blindly following a skin track, continually make these observations, weather, snowpack, terrain, and your group. By doing so, you're just gonna lend yourself to make better decisions. And now at the end of the day, you're back at the car, it still isn't over yet, all right? We need to do what we call a debrief. The debrief is how we intentionally gain experience. It's unfortunate, uh, excuse me real quick, guys, that's, Stage, put that back. I have my three year old in my room here. So uh, if you can't see my face, I'm here, anyways. So the debrief, guys, is super important. Again, this is how we intentionally are gaining experience out there. Uh, it is unfortunate that the backcountry realm uh, that is not very feedback rich. Uh, when we do get feedback, it's usually not good. It could be a life or death situation. So the debrief is how we really understand did we make good decisions as a group? And so things we want to talk about in our debrief. Uh, debrief. First and foremost, summarizing the conditions. Were the conditions what we thought? Is it what the forecast and the avalanche and weather told us we were likely to encounter? Uh, and beyond that, what went well today? What did we do good? Maybe what didn't go so well? And that could be as simple as, oh, we shouldn't have cut so far into the trees. That was super thick. That wasn't fun, right? That's just going to make your, the next time you go into that terrain, that much better. Um, so sometimes it isn't just avalanche. It could just be as simple as, oh, we should have taken a turn over that way. Um, what would we, what would we do differently going back into that same terrain next time? Kind of similar, similar to the, maybe what didn't go so well. Um, or maybe the, what didn't go so well is, oh yeah, we kind of went into that area. We talked about not potentially going into, and we had a close call. Um, and where were we most at risk today? Sometimes it could be maybe the drive just to the trailhead. Um, sometimes the most risk might be other people in the zone. Sometimes the area you were most at risk might have been crossing the creek, all right? So just recapping, the, the debrief is super important, guys. Again, this is how we intentionally gain experience rather than just haphazardly gaining experience. I'm a firm believer that somebody who does this debrief or groups that do this debrief after the end of each of their tours, they're going to become much better backcountry users much quicker than people who didn't, all right? So somebody who maybe has been skiing backcountry for 10 years that hasn't never done debriefs, I'm a firm believer that you could probably get up to their to their level by doing your debrief at the end of each tour within a couple of years. It is just super, super important. Again, that we don't, it's not a positive, it's not a feedback rich environment we're in the backcountry. And usually the feedback that we get, it's not good. Again, it can be potentially life or death. And so again, just reiterating how important this debrief is. And you should be doing it with your tour group. If you don't do it with your tour group, you should at least do it mentally on your drive home. I like to ask myself these four questions. Again, what went well? What didn't go so well? What would I do differently next time going into that same terrain? And where were we most at risk? By asking yourself those questions, you're gonna become a much better backcountry user than somebody who does not. So super, super important. Killer. Well, awesome, buddy. And uh, great work. You guys, um, Creston, thanks so much for being here. Pat, thanks for being here. Justin, um, always a pleasure. and We'll kind of run through um, some of the last questions here real quick while um, we still have uh, good attendance here, but we have really tried to answer your questions, you know, as many of them as possible live. Uh, Pat, you might open up that Q&A and just see if there's anything we didn't touch on. Uh, we don't have to go through all of them, you know, you guys can just read that Q&A section if you're curious, the Q&A is also included um, you know, in our blog post usually and, and then the recording of this as well. So um, yeah, any last minute questions, you guys get them in there. Um, feel free to let us know. We've got these guys for a few more minutes before we have to sign off here. Yeah, the one question about the uh, integration into CIC uh, with the Caltope, I, I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I can look into it further, but yeah. I had messaged him about that. I'm not sure. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. I guess just kind of reiterating some of the, some of the questions here, like you mentioned, Ben um, recordings guys, just to recap, this will be on Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but the face uh, the Weston Facebook page, this yep, should be on still. within a week or so. 
Yep. Also our website, you can go to the, the Slay at Home tab there on the Weston website. Um, and we've got all of these uh, episodes recorded and you can even find links to the upcoming episodes. Also on our YouTube page, you can find these. Sweet. Um, we had a, a question on, are we able to find previous avalanche tasks on, with KML files or using Google Earth? And uh, Pat kind of hit that one. There's a avalanchemapping.org. Not everywhere is going to have avalanche paths mapped out, but that's a great tool to use to find some that are. Um, I'm just going to keep trucking down here if that's if that's cool, Ben, and making sure everybody understands here. Uh, blogs for Colorado. There's a lot of great blogs out there. I went ahead and responded to that one. Just a quick Google search on certain areas you might want to tour into will give you some good blogs. And then there's also really good Facebook groups out there, um, especially here in Colorado that I know of. that are great resources, Colorado Backcountry Ski and Snowboard. So in relation to that question, Miguel, if you're still on here, I would highly encourage you to check that one out. It has about 10,000 people on that page. Western Backcountry Community is another great Facebook page as well. So definitely check check those out for blogs. Um, for saving stuff on CalTopo, you don't have to have Facebook. That's one of the outlets you can use. Um, but you can also use your Gmail accounts. My three, I'll turn my lights off again. Um, and then Wiley just mentioned that you can use your CalTopo maps and you can print them out on weatherproof paper. So that's a great thing to mention. Again, map and compass are something that you can always rely on. Um, some other questions in here recorded where we talked about that. How do you evaluate tree coverage in these mapping programs? Um, so me personally, Pat, Crest, and Ben, you might be able to speak to something different, but that's where this satellite imagery for myself comes in play, trying to find out where these, uh, where the tree coverage is, education. Yep. Justin, uh, remind us what your ratio is for traveling, you know, your miles per hour plus vertical feet. We had someone want to remind Yeah, you. definitely. Um, so again, it's going to vary depending upon who you're going with, but a good uh, school of thought on there is a mile to two, and up two miles an hour or a mile and a half to two miles an hour. Again, if you're breaking trail in fresh snow, you'll probably be more in the mile to mile and a half. If you're, if you're quick with some McFitties uh, or on a forest service road, you might be more to the two miles an hour plus. And then every thousand foot in elevation gain, you usually want to add an hour to that to your plan. Uh, we had a question regarding uh, Bluetooth devices. Is it suggested you keep Bluetooth away from beacons? Keep on, do you keep your watch in reach Bluetooth on? You know, I think it's what, 20 centimeters of distance you want any electronic device from your beacon. Is that what, what you go with, uh, Justin? Yeah, and that's, that might have changed. You might be right, Pat, but uh, I would, 20 to 30, 30, 30 is a safe bet. There's um, transmit versus search is, is a little bit different, but 30 to 50 centimeters um, separation is, is, would be kind of what you want to strive for. Yeah, and test this, you know, don't just think about it. You know, you can actually hold a device up to your uh, beacon, especially when it's in search mode, you could see the interference. So a good way to just simply do it. Um, another good question we had is how do you tell snow depth on CalTopo? Um, are you able, I'm able to do this with Google Earth using NOAA snow depth model. So for me personally, and I responded to that one is I use uh, snow tell sites for snow depth personally. Creston or Pat or Ben, you can maybe speak to that differently. I'm the same, yeah. Yeah, same. And that, that uh, weather station link on our, um, on our website pulls up, you know, the, the current weather station data. So you can look at that in real time and, you know, that, that gives you the best view of, um, you know, what the height of snow is in all those different locations. Sweet. This, this is my favorite question right here. Uh, kids, <laughs> Ben, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, I have a two-year-old and a two-week-old. Ben can testify to that last one there. Uh, how do you get your family or wife stoked on touring the backcountry? Uh, for me, I just throw the little dude in my backpack and take him with me. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning from the master here. I've got, I've got a two week old right now, so I can update you all um, the second I get back out into the mountains. But right now I'm, I'm pretty home based. <laughs> it, can, it can be tough for sure. Right. Uh, I, I, Justin, if, if you guys have never seen photos of Justin, you might scroll around his Instagram. I've seen some rad photos and rad videos of him and his son, Sage, <laughs> ripping around in the backcountry. It's pretty awesome to see. And I hope I 
give my daughter the same experience here soon. Yeah, buddy. Um, uh, yeah, so guys, I think that pretty much hits most of the, um, the questions we had in the Q and A. I don't see anything else really that we missed unless you guys see anything. We got one in the chat. The Snowtel tool in Caltopo inter is it interchangeable with online Snowtel sites? Anyone know that one? I'm not. That's a great question. I usually just hop on the Snowtel. Uh, personally, I haven't actually used Caltopo to find that information, um, so that would be new to me, unfortunately. Same. Yeah, same. I'm not sure. It'd be really cool if it is. I mean, like I think you guys all touched on it. It's it's amazing to see the integration of all these, you know, different platforms and I mean they just keep getting better every day. So yep. Well, awesome gang. Thanks again for being here. We really do appreciate it. And for everyone attending tonight, thanks again. We really do love connecting with all of you and make sure you tune in next week where we're going to be discussing, you know, how to recreate responsibly. We'll be kind of going over backcountry etiquette. Uh, we've got some great panelists from Leave No Trace, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, and even the state of Colorado. Um, so a lot of really cool resources, and we'll be kind of really just discussing how, how you should be operating out on trail to keep everybody happy out there and, and keep our public lands open. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Adios. Be thanks. safe.